Uh, thank you, Afshin, for that uh, kind introduction, and thank you, Matt, for organizing uh, this uh, semi uh, symposium. And I have learned a lot. And uh, this morning, I was thinking that probably within uh, SDG 14, some other other areas probably would have been more appropriate for today's symposium than ocean acidification. <laughs> However, I am at the moment involved with some work related to that. That's why I thought it will be probably the best to talk about. As you can see, I, I am a, I'm an academic in this law school, QT, and I'm also a lead author of IPCC special report on ocean and cryosphere in a changing world, changing climate. A cryosphere means uh, areas covered by ice. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a terminology they are using. Now, so, so we are dealing with actually life below water, which is, which is SDG 14. As you can see that uh, there are some uh, major issues relating to ocean mm -hmm. and communities who are dependent on ocean and coastal areas. So three billion people depend on marine and coastal biodiversity for their livelihoods and pollution threatening their livelihoods. So it is a big issue for, uh, not for just SDG 14, other SDGs, overall sustainable development of a country or the world. So we have, uh, we have the target of reducing pollution and we are not very successful in that. Uh, particularly, we are miserably failed to prevent land-based pollution to the ocean, okay? Uh, pollution from international maritime industry is uh, more or less checked now. We have a very robust international legal framework under the International Maritime Organization. But the land-based pollution is still a huge issue for us. 40% of world ocean actually suffer from overfishing. This is another problem. And, uh, you know, the climate change and Ocean acidification is not actually climate change. It is another impact of carbon emissions. <laughs> so overall climate change and other associated problem from carbon emission will create a serious problem for uh, fishing communities in the world. Uh, people, and it may create the migration of fishing somewhere and some f species may be seriously uh, affected. As a harmful fishing practices, particularly illegal, unauthorized, and unreported fishing is a, a major issue for many parts of the world. And uh, despite having many regional fisheries organization or international regional convention for this, uh, for related to fisheries, uh, the global community's success in significantly reducing IUU fishing illegal, unreported, and unauthorized fishing is not very successful. So the coral reefs are destroyed, the third item, for many reasons. And one of those regions at the moment we are facing is ocean acidification. And today I will talk about it. So this, as you can see, our SDG 14 in the context of all other SG, SDGs. So increase the, uh, one of the thing is that if you go number one, prevent and reduce marine pollution. As I said, we are not very successful. Uh, manage and protect marine and coastal uh, ecosystem. Uh, again, uh, the success is not remarkable. Address the impact of ocean acidification, which is 4.3, which we are dealing today. So, okay, what is ocean acidification? I thought it will be very difficult for me to explain it. Rather, I will use a, a very short video. Okay, it's, it's not very long, it's, it's short. By now you've heard that the way we're living is filling up our atmosphere with carbon dioxide. As a result, the planet's warming. 
heat waves and floods are more likely to be extreme and people's lives will get tougher. And the more we learn about climate change, the more risks we uncover. Since we started burning fossil fuels, the ocean has absorbed about half of all the CO2 we humans have put out. That's why it's called the planet's biggest carbon sink. Now this is good because it's kept a lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere. But as the ocean warms, it takes up less and less CO2. And with all that CO2 in the sea, scientists are shedding light on, well, an ocean of problems. Ready for the first big problem? Some sea creatures like clams, oysters, and coral, their shells and skeletons are getting weaker. Okay, you've got bigger problems than easy to crack clams? Maybe not if you're among the one in seven people who get most of their protein from seafood. Or if you understand how unstable the world would be with a billion more hungry people. What's weakening the shells? Well, these little creatures are going about their lives scooping up molecules called carbonate ions to be the building blocks of their shells. But when CO2 reacts with seawater, it releases hydrogen ions, which compete with shells for carbonate. With more hydrogen ions floating around in the ocean, our little friends have to spend more energy building their shells and have less energy for finding food. That means it's harder to grow and more will die off before they get big. So the fish that eat the clams or live among the coral will have a harder time surviving, meaning the fish that dine on them won't have enough to eat. And so we won't have enough to eat. Remember those pesky hydrogen ions generated by more CO2? They don't just take away the carbonate ions that these little clams need. They also make the ocean more acidic. It's already become 30% more acidic since we started spewing all this CO2, and it could get much worse. We could change the ocean's chemistry so much that shells actually start to dissolve. That means if we don't turn this problem around, your great-grandkids might think of reefs the way you think of a dodo bird. And with one in four ocean species living in coral reef ecosystems, weaker coral could threaten the foundation of the whole ocean food chain. But why panic, right? Life always seems to find a way to adapt, but it needs time. In a few decades, we might make the oceans more acidic than they've been in 20 million years. It's hard to imagine any ecosystem quickly adapting to that big of a change. But things don't have to get that bad. We've started this problem, and we're going to fix it, beginning at its source carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels. Learn more at aspace.org. Okay. I thought rather than me explaining, someone whose training is only in law, it will be better to use that video. Okay. So one of the target uh, of SDG 14 is to minimize and address ocean acidification. Uh, it was very interesting that they isolated one and put it very specifically as one of the target, 14.3. Actually, uh, there are a number of other impact we may have on ocean. One is another is ocean warming because of the global warming. Another one is deoxygenation of ocean. So, but uh, this one, of course, they understood, they, they thought it's a very important and probably more uh, impactful issue. So it's another problem created by carbon dioxide emission, as, I have, as you have seen in this video. And according to 2017 report of the UN Secretary General on the progress towards SDGs, studies of marine acidity at open ocean and coastal sites around the world have indicated that current levels are often outside the industrial bounds. Coupled with ocean warming and deoxygenation, as I said, are creating acidification is creating serious threat to the marine biodiversity. Okay, now I say that uh, this is a paper on international law. What law we have? Uh, Paris, Agre Paris Agreement uh, mentioned about ocean, but it doesn't talk about ocean acidification specifically. But of course, uh, Paris is very relevant because as you have seen that uh, videos which made basically for kids, <laughs> But it gives one lesson to us that uh, the biggest way of fighting ocean acidification, the main way will be uh, reducing carbon emissions. Okay, that's, so that's why entire Paris or United Nations uh, Convention on Law of the Sea, which, uh, United Nations Convention, uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, not Law of the Sea, ENFCCC, Kyoto Protocol, and now we have Paris, the entire international climate change legal framework is uh, relevant here. Uh, However, uh, these problems, ocean acidification and other two problems, are not directly covered uh, in any of the international existing legal instruments. 
and it will have uh, it has to be considered in the context of climate change ocean governance marine environmental protection fisheries all this aspect so there is a uh, we need to re-examine our, our existing legal framework whether they are addressing this new problem and because when we are talking about in that small video which as i say, I, I have shown it's made for kids but it's actually shows us some known legal concept in climate change law. You can see in that small video, you will find part, you will see that it's talking about mitigation without using the word. It is talking about adaptation, showing those peoples. And it is also talk about lots of hungry people, loss and damage. <laughs> so all these things in this small video actually you'll find. So we have to think all these uh, climate change legal concepts which we lawyer learn after started reading climate change, about climate change, uh, in the context of ocean acidification, uh, because it may have all, uh, those, all those things are relevant for ocean acidification problem. Sorry. So as I said, climate change, ocean governance, marine environment, fisheries and environment. I, I just had a quick look on this uh, five areas of international and regional legal framework, how they are relevant for our problem. Uh, climate change, as you can see, uh, there are three main instruments, UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Kyoto Protocol, and Paris Agreement. Uh, they do not, uh, do not uh, adequately address uh, the issue of ocean acidification, okay? Uh, their overall goal for reduction of emissions will be, uh, will be positive for mitigation of climate change impact on the ocean and coastal areas, so, of course. If Paris is successful, then we will not have this problem, probably. <laughs> so it's very, very simplified. <laughs> it's Kyoto uh, is gone, and uh, that's why. So ocean-related issues actually did not get uh, proper emphasis. I was reading an article uh, someone published on NDCs, nationally determined contributions of states under the Paris Agreement, and they were highlighting that uh, ocean did not get the what action government will take in their respective ocean areas, because you know that the states Coastal states has jurisdiction have jurisdiction over up to 200, uh, 200 nautical miles areas, which is known as exclusive economic zone. And apart from that, uh, sometimes their continental shelf can be even further extended than that uh, in some circumstances. So, so it, it it is not highlighted. It is not highlighted in the existing NDCs the way it should be because it's two thirds of the world is ocean. Okay. Uh, the next areas of law is uh, 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 law of the sea, ocean and uh, ocean and marine environment. United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. Charles mentioned it briefly. Uh, there are general obligation under some articles that you need to protect your marine environment. So there is a general obligations of the member states and the global community as a whole, who are member of this. And uh, climate change issues are actually, although uh, UNCLOS is a very difficult instrument to amend, it's a big legal instrument dealing with lots of complex issues, but climate change issues are now considered in some uh, marine environmental legal instruments. They started talking about it at least. Uh, Marpole Convention, which is International Convention for Prevention of Pollution from Ships, popularly known as Marple Convention, which is the major convention adopted by uh, International Maritime Organization in 1973, uh, and it's a replaced a convention which was adopted in 1955, another or 54. Mm -hmm. So Marple was adopt, uh, amended six years ago to include some provision regarding reduction of greenhouse gas emissions from international maritime industry. But these are not enough. And London Protocol, 
was a protocol of London Dumping Convention, which deal with dumping of waste in the ocean, dumping in the ocean, uh, was amended uh, to include some uh, provision regarding carbon capture and storage in subseabed geological formations for permanent isolation and marine geoengineering activities. So it was, adopt, uh, it was also, but regional marine environmental legal governance system yet to incorporate adequate, uh, adequate uh, provisions. How, uh, let me explain very briefly about regional marine environmental governance structure of the world. We had a very big program in the United Nations Environment Program, which is now called UN Environment in 1970, 74 or before. Mm -hmm. After that, uh, through that program, lots of regional seas program established, like South Asian Regional Seas Program, East Asian Regional Seas Program. Mm -hmm. And some of these regional seas program were able to adopt regional marine environmental legal convention, legal and environment agreement, uh, conventional legal instrument. Um, and uh, just few of these now started mentioning about climate change because they were initially targeted to prevent land-based marine pollution, pollution from vessels or other marine pollution which we know about it. But few of them now started dealing with climate change issues. Okay. So then we have General Environmental Convention. Uh, Charles mentioned about uh, CBD, uh, Biological Diversity Convention, Vienna Convention on Ozen Layer and at it Associated Protocols, World Heritage Convention, Ramshar Convention, CMS or the Bonn Convention. Yes, these, as I say that these are not these are not adopted for combating climate change. These are very specific convention for a specific purpose. CBD is for biodiversity. Vienna Convention is to protect the ozone layer. World Heritage Convention is the World Heritage Site. And CMS or the Bonn Convention for other purpose. But now there are discussion going on with this, this convention. You know, most of these bigger conventions, what, what a trend we have now, they established Conference of Parties, COP. <laughs> so now climate change is increasingly getting attention in the COPs, Conference of Parties of this uh, convention. And these systems are, uh, are actually now increasingly considering. But as you know, like any other country's administration, the bureaucracy, whether it is international bureaucracy or national bureaucracy, they have their domain, okay? So climate change is even FCCC's domain. <laughs> it's not their domain, the one we are discussing. But it's increasingly coming, increasingly coming. And the final one, which is uh, very important, this, this is my last slide. Uh, sorry. Fisheries. We have a fish stock agreement. And under that, we have lots of regional fisheries agreements in the world in the different region. Some are specialized on certain species, some are general fisheries. So uh, there are some research which saying that the way currently those fisheries agreements or system fisheries management organizations work in the regional level will face lots of challenges in the future because of the impact of, because of the ocean acidification and other impact on the ocean, the changing ocean. Mm -hmm. Okay, the way they operate. So they also need to consider. What finally I can say, uh, this was my last slide. Okay, I have another two minutes? One minute, okay. Okay, I'll finish it in one minute. So uh, uh, this is a new area, ocean acidification. To be honest, when we have uh, any new problem, lawyers jump into it to solve it. And you will find 60, 70, 80 page article discussing on ocean acidification. At the end, you will find that very few legal instruments will be really, they will not say at the moment, at the beginning, they will ask, they will, so that you read the paper. But at the end, you will find that these are not specifically for this problem. I'm not proposing that you need to have one legal instrument for every problem. 
but uh, uh, how ocean acidification will have an impact on climate change mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, how they are relevant. Uh, we don't have a, a very strong international or regional legal framework addressing it. But okay, in one sense we have, as I said earlier, that okay, the biggest way of solving this problem will not to, to halt the climate change, <laughs> to reduce the emission. And Paris is, of course, uh, at least uh, Paris Agreement wants to do it. That's for, so in that case, yeah, we have something. But other agreements, uh, Law of the Sea Convention and all other environmental conventions, when they were adopted, uh, so far I can remember from my memory, ocean acidification was not something in the mind of the drafters of those conventions. Thank you so much.